he does Sesame Street, Muppet Show, Fraggle Rock, Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, Ring of Bells. Yes, yes, okay, okay, cool. All right, cool, that's, okay, just being clear that I'm just gonna talk about this guy and people know who he is, right? Okay, cool. All right, so uh, his origins were in Leland, Mississippi. Uh, he was one of the smartest kids in his class. Uh, do we have a Leland person here? <laughs> um, and he loved hiking outdoors, and most of all, he liked creating uh, his creative projects, including sewing with his grandma and making radios with his older brother. But his fondest memories were of being with his large, loving family, telling stories together at the dinner table, and he retained that uh, love of storytelling throughout his life. Um, and moving to Maryland, he studied at the University of Maryland, and uh, he fell in love with television there, which he felt was the medium of the future at the time. Believe it or not, there are things before phones and internet and stuff like that. Television was the breakout medium, and, uh, and uh, he just saw a puppeteering job opening at the local new, uh, TV station. He got two bucks on puppeteering and just studied that and got the job. It was, puppeteering was merely a means to an end for him. Uh, he just wanted to get in television. He didn't care about puppeteering uh, initially very much at all. And uh, he studied at University of Maryland in home economics, which taught sewing, puppeteering, and the classes were mostly women. And people asked him, oh, did you, what did you think of that, it being mostly women? He said, it was glorious. Um, so uh, good for him, good old Jimmy boy. Uh, uh, so uh, and around this time, he had a trip to, and uh, also he had a show, Sam and Friends, that he st started to get going after a while in the local station. So around this time, he went to Europe, and. He actually realized in Europe, puppeteering was an art form for not just children, like in the US, but also for adults. And it would become a lifelong goal for him to create puppeteering for adults in the US. A short-term goal was macking on the ladies by the set. Um, and then uh, he met, and then at the University of Maryland, another classmate stood out to him who was a great performer. And this would become, this was Jane Nebel, who was a talented puppeteer in her own right. And would become a wife and collaborator with Jim and uh, would help with hiring decisions and creative uh, input and whatnot. So uh, Muppet Zing started to take off. Okay, uh, you can tell what's going on here, uh, but uh, work in Washington from Sam and Friends on late night appearances started to get the attention of advertisers. Uh, a breakout advertising gig for Wilkins Coffee would lead to more paid work and Muppet Zing became more financially sustainable while being something fun too. So in the, the premise of these uh, commercials here is that Wilkins would say he wouldn't want to drink Wilkins Coffee and then Wilkins would blow him up in some fantastic way. So uh, funny enough, Jim himself didn't like coffee, so art imitates life in that kind of way. And uh, yeah, so uh, uh, yeah. And it's a way of making things financially sustainable while being having fun at the same time too. Um, so uh, around this time period, Jim's life would be molded by this concept of a race against time. Uh, after the death of his grandfather, for instance, Jim Copy uh, coped by uh, being creative and create a puppet out of his mother's milky blue coat. And this creature would just be called Kermit. It wasn't exactly clear what it was yet. It was kind of, kind of abstract. He liked the idea of abstract creatures. But later on, it would become more solidified as Kermit the Frog. Um, also around this time period, his brother, who was uh, on his way to becoming a pilot, he got in a fatal car accident and passed away. And his brother was brilliant too, having made radios with Jim and Leland in his youth, but uh, Jim felt the pressure, now I have to be both him and me. Um, uh, Jim always sensed that he wouldn't have enough time to complete his life's work, and also in, the, and in light of this, uh, this like, uh, finality of reality uh, that we all face, uh, Jim formed a sense of melancholy and optimism to all this work that kind of permeated through everything. An example of this was in this work, Tick Tock Sick, which is about the constant motion of time forward, and then also in this more experimental piece, uh, which was an Academy Award nominated best live action short film in 1965. Jim Foley storyboarded this. It depicts a man's race against time with his trademark humor and experimental storytelling. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, this was his, so his approach in, his approach towards viewing the specter of death was to just make a crazy film out of it and get an Academy Award nomination. Not a bad way of going about things. Um, so in his race against time, he finds uh, love in his collaborators. He forms his group with Don Celine, who made the classic Muppet look Jerry Jewell, who became a writer, Jerry Nelson and Richard Hunt, who would become performers, Bernie Brillstein and David Laser would help with the business side. But there's this one kid who is a 19-year-old who would join and become a remarkable creative partner and also like a younger brother to Jim. Uh, Frank Oz, pictured here, would perform Fozzie Bear, Miss Piggy and Yoda, and uh, in a way, Jim found a family in his creative team. Um, Muppetson con had continued success with appearances on Ed Sullivan, Today's Show, Jimmy Dean, and 
Funny enough, the first breakout Muppet character is Rolf the dog. I don't, how many of you actually knew that? Anyway, some, okay, some people, okay, cool. Yeah, um, yeah, it's, uh, and that was performed by both Jim and Frank with uh, Jim doing the mouth and then Frank performing the right hand crouched around Jim getting his arm around him. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah, now a side character, the origins of Muppets started with Rolf the dog. Um, paid work in advertising and shows would uh, fund Jim's experimental filmmaking. Uh, pictured on the left is the documentary Youth 68. Pictured on the right is a surrealist, absurdist TV film called The Cube. And uh, in the middle we have a uh, psychedelic nightclub of the future called Cyclia, which they did get the, the, to the stage of looking for space in Manhattan for. Uh, here's some footage. Uh, Jim was at his heart a hippie. This would be projected onto, onto go-go dancers, as pictured in this top image here. But uh, what would take off for Jim was not that for some reason. I don't know why not. I think that would have sold. A, that would have made a lot of money. But um, what took off was a pilot for some children's entertainment show, children's educational show. Uh, you can guess what it is. It's Sesame Street. 1966, Joan Gans Cooney formed the Children's Television Workshop in the aftermath of the Robert F. Kennedy assassination, the Vietnam War protests, and the funeral of Martin Luther King Jr. Cooney gathered a team of experts to make a show to address the lack of pre-K education in underprivileged households while appealing to children's fascination with commercials. Uh, they tried to bring on collaborators, but during one of the meetings they had a little bit of a hiccup. They noticed a strange wild-haired man who looked like a cross between Abraham Lincoln and Jesus dressed in sandals. And he could have been a member of one of the Weathermen, an anarcho-terrorist organization at the time that was bombing different organizations. But no, it was Jim Henson. Um, and then uh, he would become a great collaborator. They made classic characters like Big Bird, Oscar the Grouch, and Bert and Ernie, performed by Jim and Frank Oz, of course. And, uh, and Jim felt like this wasn't exactly his direction. It was less experimental, but he did see value in Joan's goal of educating children, especially interesting to Jim at the time with his family of five, uh, five children and his wife. And as says, but Sesame Street became more an, of an international success, but Jim was feeling more pigeonholed as a children's entertainer. Um, so ever since his trip to Europe as a youth, Jim was still trying to figure out how to do a show for adults, just like going in all sorts of different directions. And he was brought on to the early versions of SNL, uh, Saturday Night Live, with his characters, The Land of Gorch. Yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty right in line with SNL's kind of stuff, right? Uh, I don't know. There certainly was creative tension, and they ultimately didn't know how to gel the two styles together, and ultimately parted ways am amicably, but not without John Belushi calling them the mugging of puppets. Um, then Jim kept trying to pitch other ty uh, TV show pilots for adults. It was hard to communicate coming from Sesame Street, so he even called one of his pilots Muppets Sex and Violence, just to really get that message across. Um, and they made this pitch reel. Uh, see it's playing? Cool. And eventually they did get accepted by Sir Lou Grade in England, but it wouldn't be through networks in the US, it would be through syndication, and it would be an international success. But uh, they did make this crazy kind of pitch reel. So, uh, so the Muppet Show represents Jim in full gear at the height of his collaborative skills and, and uh, at the height of his collaborative skills. He valued everyone as contributors, even listening to suggestions from their janitor. Uh, and he, uh, the whole time he was gentle, uh, Martin G. Baker, producer of Muppets Inc., said, you worked with Jim, not for him. Uh, let's get these gifts going. Yeah, there we go. Uh, likewise, uh, the show featured a bunch of crazies running all over the place, and Kermit and Jim tried to avoid casting Kermit as the lead of the show, casting Robin at first, but uh, he realized that the show needed that kind of center that only he could portray, so Kermit became the center of it all, and uh, likewise, Jim was at the center of all the craziness. Of and after 120 episodes of Madness, uh, the, just enough for syndicated reruns, Jim moves on to other work in film. Um, so, uh, so uh, Jim spins off The Muppet Show into a movie, which was the first movie using a mostly puppet cast and uh, puppets in a live action setting rather than on a set. And this kind of quote, I feel, summarizes Jim's philosophy towards his work and his collaborators. It's about singing and dancing and making people happy. That's the kind of dream that gets better the more people you share it with. And, well, I don't know what it is that you like about your friends who have the same dream. And, 
That kind of makes us like a family. Yeah, that's cheesy, isn't it? No, no, I can't say that. Um, so they make sequels, The Great Muppet Caper and Muppets Take Manhattan, the latter of which would be directed by Frank Oz, creating Muppet Babies in the process. And uh, Frank would go on to form his own career as a director in his own right. Jim am amicably lets him move on to his own work beyond Muppets Inc. Meanwhile, Jim moves away from the Muppets, seeking to create puppetry for adults, his dream since his trip to Europe. And Jim collaborates with visual designer Brian Froud to create Dark Crystal in 1982, featuring no Muppets and no humans, just these kind of like realistic, dark kind of fantasy puppets. And it has a very mixed reception after Jim's legacy of being working on Sesame Street and on the Muppet movies and the Muppet show. Uh, it was kind of like too far from the Muppets, too dark. Where are the humans? People didn't know what was going on exactly. Um, but, uh, but it's still regarded as like, but now after the fact, it's been kind of regarded as uh, quite a work in its own right. Um, this marked it, and the split between these two kinds of works, between the Muppets and, and uh, uh, Dark Crystal, sort of marked the division of the company between Muppets East in England and Muppets West in New York City. And Jane was in New York and Mupp Jim was in England. So after the movie's over, Jane and Jim have grown apart. They formally separate and Jim starts to see other women. Um, what, are we getting a woo for that? Um, <laughs> No, this is, no, that's, that's David Bowie, uh, so, uh, okay, why not, um, what's up, yeah, uh, I don't have the pants in this shot, um, but, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, no, I'll, I'll get that next time, uh, so, uh, Fraggle Rock is the next project that Jim's ambition is to stop a war with, it was developed with an international audience in mind, and the company's large enough at this point that his staff mostly handles it without Jim, in England, Jim works on Labyrinth in the meantime, trying to learn from the failures of the Dark Crystal, featuring real actors, a lighter tone, and after a recommendation from his son, casting David Bowie uh, to do the music. And also, it was executive produced by George Lucas after, collab after their collaboration with Yoda on Star Wars. Um, it also has a mixed reception, but Jim was proud of the project, and of course, Labyrinth would become a cult classic, even featuring like a $50 board game at GameStop, which I still, I don't know, I'm still hesitating on buying it. I don't know, I don't know if I should buy it or not. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe later, maybe, maybe, maybe it's not, oh, whatever, okay. Um, so Jim felt like uh, movies weren't really working well for him, so he returned to television uh, and uh, with two shows. Uh, one was The Storyteller, which adapted fairy tales and won an Emmy. And uh, then with the Jim Henson Hour, he tried to connect many different ideas, some light and some dark, and uh, it, to mixed results. Um, and it was kind of like this tough point where Jim was kind of focusing on the administrative stuff and moving away from being creative, which was what is, he was specialized in. And Richard Hunt, one of the performers, said to Jim, is, he was getting further away, and Jim just said to him, I'm trying, Richard. Um, which, like, to, if you hear that from Jim, that's not a good sign. That means something's gone horribly wrong. So um, by 1989, uh, Jim tries to offload all that administrative stuff with Disney and they get in discussions with Michael Eisner. They make a deal on a handshake as Jim liked to do it. Uh, Jim loved the parks. Uh, they worked on the Muppet 3D attraction at Disney World and it was very rough negotiations. Um, although generally talking to Michael would smooth things over, it did start to take a toll on Jim's health. Jim referred to it as that goddamn deal, which hearing if you hear that from him, is the equivalent of just a tirade of four letter words. You don't want to hear Jim say that goddamn deal. Like that's a bad sign. And, uh, and it did take a toll on his health. Uh, he got a throat infection, which was really rare for him to get sick. And uh, he wouldn't treat it. Um, on May 4th, 1990, Jim would appear on Arsenio Hall. And he was appearing under the weather, but uh, it would be Jim's last public appearance. Uh, he avoided seeing seeing doctors in his life due to his, due to his Christian up science to do, <coughs> excuse me, due to his Christian science upbringing. Little did he know he had a rare strain of strep throat. He'd see family members, his ex-wife Jane, and would be rushed to the emergency room just a few hours too late. He passes away on May 16th, 1990. Sorry to bring it down after like a night light, uh, n like a light night of drinking. Everybody, we gotta bring it down a little bit. Um, so uh, they have the, so all of his collaborators want to put on a show according to Jim's wish, last wishes. And uh, they have it at, at St. John the Divine Cathedral in Manhattan. Um, uh, Joan Gans Cooney was there from the Children's Television Workshop. 
George Lucas, executive producer of Labyrinth. Performers would perform his favorite songs. And Harry Belafonte would perform Turn the World Around. And Carol Spinney performing Big Burn in a Bird in a Green Tie as an homage to Kermit, performing Bean Green. Many speeches were had filled with laughter and joy. Okay, I'm about to tear up here if I keep that going. So, um, so uh, Jim always did see, see his life was going to end soon, end too soon. So he left a message for everyone that Richard Hunt would say at the memorial: Please watch out for each other, love everyone, and forgive everyone, including yourself. Forgive your anger, forgive your guilt, your shame, your sadness. Embrace and open up your love, your joy, your truth, most especially your heart. And Jim's legacy would live on. Uh, Sesame Street is continued to be owned by Sesame Workshop, formerly Children's Television Workshop. Jim Henson Foundation continues to support puppetry. The Muppets characters would be acquired by Disney in 2004, completing Jim's goal before passing. And uh, Jim, uh, one of Jim's quotes that he would say was that, when I was young, my ambition was to be one of the people who made a difference in the world. My hope is to leave the world a little better for having been here. I think he's done that, certainly. His biography, the book Street Gang and the Museum of the Moving Image has a permanent exhibition now, opening this year, promotes his legacy and informed a lot of the facts of this talk. And his family continues his legacy working in his companies and in their work in the entertainment industry beyond. And his message continues to influence the next generation. And in case you can see what that bench says, it says, uh, to the joyful life of Jim Henson, who loved this walk in the park. That's in Central Park. Uh, maybe you can visit sometime. Uh, and uh, it's very nondescript and low key, which is very Jim. So uh, yeah, uh, feel free to stay in touch. Yeah. Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.